Hello, everyone. This is Fire Chief Paul Dow with Albuquerque Fire Rescue. Now, this podcast is designed to bring you helpful training and best practices and some additional resources that you can access from anywhere. So thank you for joining us and enjoy today's episode. Engine 3, Rescue 378. It's going to be near Graceland and Copper, Firebox 8172. It's going to be a 9 Echo. Caller says 40-year-old male, unconscious, not breathing. That's Graceland at Copper, 9 Echo 1, Engine 3, Rescue 378. Hello again, this is uh, Clint Anderson, B-Shift 78. Uh, joined again with Captain Kevin Ferrando and Lieutenant Jeff Rossetti. Here to discuss, uh, this is a, a podcast continuation from our cardiac arrest uh, podcast here. Now talking about uh, the things that we do. Let's say you've checked all your boxes during your cardiac arrest and you've been giving your medications, and now you have return of spontaneous circulation. So upon ROSC, we're going to discuss uh, things that we want to do. Uh, like I would say, expectations, we'll outline the guidelines, and then we'll go into some pharmacology just to uh, kind of outline some specifics for everybody. Oftentimes, not things that you folks don't already know, but it never hurts to have these discussions. And again, to emphasize things that maybe your friendly neighborhood 7-8 might be looking for and folks in the ER and uh, stuff that will really set you up for success uh, when and if you do get ROSC on these cardiac arrest patients. Uh, with all that being said, I'm going to go ahead and uh, point over to my colleague, uh, Captain Ferrando here, and we'll, uh, we'll delve into it. So you're at your cardiac arrest and we have ROSC. So... It's always the goal of every of every code that we go to. We hopefully get that ROSC. We walking in, we see that the person has gotten palpable pulses. Uh, now crew's kind of it's hurry up and go fast or hurry up and go slow. It's you kind of have that time to okay. Let's just make sure this is going to be a sustained ROSC. So we're going to want to make sure we get a 12 lead on. We're going to want to get O2 sats. We're now we're going to want to get that BGL taken. Um, you know these are things that don't necessarily have to be rushed, but you know, you're trying to just make sure that we're gonna, we're not gonna move this person and they're gonna re-arrest immediately. We wanna make sure that we're gonna have that sustained ROS because that way it's gonna be easier to work this person. It's gonna hopefully have a better success rate. We can get that 12 lead then transmitted to that receiving hospital. So if they are having that STEMI or whatever, maybe that underlying condition that caused that cardiac event, uh, that they can start prepping that hospital to to get uh, you know set up for the cath lab, get that patient set up for whatever thrombolytics they're going to be doing, um, you know, because they're going to be moving to either the cath lab or ICU, and so uh, once we get that that set up, uh, that's kind of that first phase. Twelve leads crews are really good about it now. You'll see them already have the twelve leads out. Uh, they're getting that blood pressure. They're getting that uh, O2 sat. And you know what we're now thinking is even more progressive is we're looking at these pressors. So what we're trying to do is increase that, that contractility of that heart. You know, if this person's in that cardiogenic shock, um, they're gonna have that low blood pressure. Uh, that's very high risk that they're gonna go back into that arrest. So um, one of the things that we're usually doing now in the field is someone, there's always, there's enough people now in these codes at this point uh, between AFR, AS, that someone can now start either getting uh, levofed from an AS unit or we're starting to have a lot of proactive guys that are getting the epi mini drips or epi boluses and um, an epi drip ready to go in the event that this person is that candidate for uh, presser. Uh, Jeff, uh, real quick, I'm gonna ask you, how do you usually like it set up? Are you delegating it off or are you actually the one doing it? Um, what's kind of your thought process as far as those candidates for uh, pressers? So generally speaking, I think the, the person uh, who's kind of controlling the medications um, throughout the code is generally the person who uh, I'll delegate to kind of manage medications post ROSC as well. So as we talked, as we discussed uh, with, with the cardiac arrest um, discussion, you know, we talked about being ready and having things in place. And as Captain Ferrando mentioned, you know, having that 12 lead and all the vital signs and everything else, you can have all of that ready in anticipation for that ROSC. Um, so that when you do see that spike in capnography, you're already ready to go. You understand that this is a potentially viable situation and you're ready to proceed. Another thing is also with that presser is have that ready. Um, having that mini bolus is something super easy. Uh, 
we already have these one to tens or if we mix a one to ten we already have that available to us and it's a very simple transition into that that mini bolus from there that can be held aside or even sometimes i'll just ask uh, that i hold it so that i know which medication i i have that and it's not getting mixed up and if we choose to use it it's ready to go immediately in conjunction with these other things the 12 lead post pressure and that sort of thing yeah, chance chance favors the prepared. So if you if you anticipate these things and you have these things ready to put into play, um, that'll really lessen the time on scene post ROSC prior to getting transport. And the idea, um, our colleague Rob Laprice always likes to say, once you know the, the chance of them rearresting on scene is always pretty high. And what better place to manage that rearrest than right there on scene if we're already kind of doing these post rosc vitals, as opposed to when they're halfway onto a gurney and we're hurrying to get in the back of an ambulance, and then everything else is done kind of. And I think there's probably some 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 of the, the folks that have the better returns too that we get that quick rosc. We are able to get those 12 leads, those things done on scene, like like Clint was saying. Um, those ones seem like they have the better chances of actually staying in that positive, staying in that uh, rosc and not re-arresting. It's those ones that are the fragile ones where you're kind of like, well, I think I feel a pole, so I do, and then you lose it and you get it and you lose it and you get it. Those ones might, that's where you might want to really stay on scene. So like I was saying, our epis are going to be in a one to 10,000 in a 10 cc syringe. Uh, making those epi drips are very quick and easy or making those mini boluses are very easy. You know, you're squirting out nine cc's, you're, you're bringing in uh, nine cc's of saline, you're making that one to 100,000, uh, you're giving that cue every one minute and so you know you really the goal is is to keep that blood pressure up uh, when we're mixing that epi drip uh, we're putting one milligram of one to one thousand in a 250 cc bag usually with a goal of looking at two micrograms per minute increments uh, up to a max of 10 and there again it's titrate to effect we don't want to be giving this person too much uh, we want to make sure that we're giving the right med to the right patient so you know still we're doing cross checks we're still checking pressures we're giving this to um, effect, not just arbitrarily giving a, a presser for the sake of it. We're doing it, make sure that these are can patients that are the can right candidate for that. You know, another thing that we, was, we need to talk about is while we're still on scene, and a lot of this stuff does happen there, uh, we're keeping them on the Lucas. So in case of an arrest, you know, their hands are secured in the Lucas device. The Lucas is in place. We're just pulling that puck off the chest. We're making plenty of access for uh, 12 lead access, keeping the pads on. Um, it's very quick, very easy just to replace the puck, reposition the puck, hit play, and we're start back into our normal uh, algorithm. You know, and then if, assuming this patient does get put on the gurney and now we're in the back of 5-5, five, five, you know, we're still just constantly monitoring. You know, these, these assessments are, are they're very cyclical. You come around in a circle. So you start from the top, you go through it, and then you just kind of do it again. Well, one of the things that you can think about is starting that passive hypothermia. Uh, it's just one more step in hopefully this person's chances of survival. You know, ice packs in the groin, ice packs into the armpits. Uh, we're not looking to, you know, freeze them, but we're just trying to cool off core parts where that blood flow is at, the, at, its, at its highest. Clint, anything to add to this? Yeah, I'd, I really like that you mentioned, you know, raising that puck, but keeping the Lucas in place. We've all, any, any one of us that's been here, obviously prior to Lucas, has been in the back of an ambulance when there's been a rearrest, and there's this haphazard, one hand's bracing, one hand's trying to do compressions. It's inefficient and it places crew members, it places AS or AFR uh, in that position where there's a lot of potential for injury. And that's one of the big reasons we got the Lucas was to be able to free our hands up and to keep our guys safer as we do that. I want you guys to remember that if you haven't done it or if you need help doing it, we 7 eights are happy to help coach you. And oftentimes there should be a medic that knows to look on the life pack and be able to set uh, routine vitals. So you can set that BP to cycle every minute, every two minutes, every five minutes, whatever you decide to set it at, so that you don't have to worry about hitting the NIBP button every time you decide to reassess to see where your pressure is and see how your, your presser administration has gone um, or how it's progressing. That way, this, you know, there's more stuff you can give to the ER when you, uh, when you arrive. And uh, again, what Kevin's alluding to, we're reevaluating everything. So just Straight back to paramedic school, you've placed the patient onto something else. You've got them in the back of the ambulance. I want to reevaluate tube placement, just like Mr. Rossetti was talking about. I want to be checking my capnography, make sure I have good waveform, make sure it's still consistent. I can check the lung sounds and just reassessing everything else, making sure that we've transmitted that STEMI if that's what we have and uh, that we have all these things in place. Again, 
A lot of this is setting ourselves up for success. So again, if you anticipate these things, it never hurts to have it ready. And that way when that eventuality happens, which often it does, chance favors the prepared. So continuing in on our post rosk discussion here, and I will uh, throw this one over to Mr. Rossetti. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm just going to ask you basically if, uh, if you would just kind of let us know what, what, we, what we're looking at as far as epi dosages and if we're looking at these hypotensive patients and we want to set up for our drips, how are you going to do that? All right, so with epi uh, in this, uh, this situation here, uh, in the ROSC scenario, um, we're talking about the epinephrine mini bolus. And, and what that really is, is uh, it's a 1 to 100,000 mix. It's easily converted from the 1 to 10 that we already have and, uh, or the 1 to 10 that we have created uh, based on the shortage that we've been experiencing. Um, we have that 1 to 10 and we used it during the cardiac arrest anyway. So we, we already have this prepared. Um, it's ready to go. And, and that's kind of an easy way to, to administer this, uh, the push presser. Again, I think it was mentioned, one cc increments, you're given 10 micrograms, and you can do this over a minute, and you can, you know, this is titrated to effect. So, uh, as we also mentioned before, you know, monitoring these blood pressures and things of that nature also um, help with that. Also, something that we're able to do is a uh, an epi drip. Um, usually, that, that mini bolus is kind of good out, out of the gate. It's easily... Um, manipulated, you can use it quickly. You're not creating any more snag hazards and things of that nature by hanging in other bags and moving the patient with these things and things that we kind of run into. So uh, we're continuing our discussion here on uh, post-ROSC treatment for our patients, obviously pre-arrival to the hospital here. And uh, I'm gonna throw a question uh, Lieutenant Rossetti's way here. Let's say you, uh, you have your patient, you've gotten ROSC, You've moved slow and smooth through this ROSC. You got your 12 lead. You've sustained your, uh, you've sustained this return of pulses, and you have everything else ready. The patient is packaged, and on the ambulance, you're going in route, and your vital signs read a rate of 40 or 50, and your blood pressure is about 70 over 40. So you're looking at as you know a symptomatic bradycardic patient. Um, how are you gonna How are you gonna go down that route? Well, for me, so I think that uh, the, with the symptomatic bradycardia, you know, because we just came off of uh, a cardiac arrest, I feel like um, the heart is, is super irritable at this moment. And I think that pacing is a preferred method um, in this instance. You go, uh, you, you talk about bradycardia and atropine is in the conversation. Uh, but I think in this particular situation, providing that electricity and keeping things uh, moving that direction is, is probably the most effective and, and controllable way to do this. But you also got to consider, right? So if, if as you're pacing, you're not getting the blood pressure correlation that you're expecting or, or that you're wanting, um, you also, you know, have the option to move down the route of the, the vasopressors as well. To the keep. ones that Kevin was talking about? Correct. Sure. Correct. Uh, that way you can kind of supplement what you're doing with the pacing, providing a bolus and also giving these medications. So let's say that you're upgraded and you're in the seven, eight spot. And this guy tells you after the fact, he's like, oh, you know, crud cap. I, 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 uh, I didn't go straight to pacing. I did the atropine first. Is that something that's, that's going to negatively affect this patient or? No, I, it, I don't think so. I think it's one of those situations where uh, you can, you can try that. You're also going to look at your 12 lead and there's those certain situations. They're not necessarily contraindicated, but they're, they're not advised, you know, those high level heart blocks. So to answer your, your question there, Cap, I think uh, the preferred method uh, in this situation is going to be be pacing. Uh, if someone did administer atropine, the discussion is, is it going to work? Uh, and, and generally speaking, maybe for those for sinus bradycardia, but if we're moving towards, you know, high level heart blocks, you know, up to the third degree block. We're, we're not going to that medication isn't going to impact um, the pulse at all. Um, and so that's why pacing is kind of a guaranteed, you know, the standard, I think, where you get you get the, the response that you're looking for. Um, but it, if you did, if one were to use atropine, they probably wouldn't get the effect they were searching for in those high level, high level blocks and would need to, to revisit that pacing anyway. So sure. um, I don't, I don't think it's something to worry about, but it um, something to think about. Yeah, absolutely. And just understanding that we have certain tools in our toolbox. Some are going to work in certain circumstances, some won't. 
just to break it down, we're, we're looking off of our guidelines onto the, again, the, uh, the, the post ROSC algorithms here. They have four different sections and we've done pretty well here covering the, uh, the bradycardia, the symptomatic bradycardia, which almost helps us to segue into the hypotension, back into the drips that uh, Captain Ferrando talked about. And those two may come in, come hand in hand. And again, you wanna you know, manage that pressure, be able to, you know, to, to reassess your interventions. But moving right along, we'll, uh, we'll move from there to our dysrhythmias. And you're, you know, you're managing various dysrhythmias during the cardiac arrest. And you, it may be an ongoing sort of a management as we get into ROSC, as we're running into the hospital. But uh, Captain Ferrando, I wanted to just kinda to ask you, you know, as far as dosages, indications, we, we hit briefly on lidocaine. Yeah, Clint. So uh, as it pertains to the, the dysrhythmias, you know, we get this, this ROSC. Um, these hearts are very unhappy. Sometimes, you know, I like to look at it as maybe let's take it a little bit slower, let them get back to their, you know, what was a, more of a normal rhythm, you know, because that was quite a bit of insult to that heart. We don't know what necessarily caused that arrest, but now that it, it happened and now we're past that, um, we could definitely see a, a something like a wide uh, wide complex tachycardia. I'd probably have a little bit of reservations about giving lidocaines, but you know you start looking at those medications that you can give for those, and you know lidocaine is going to be that wide complex, that unstable patient. Um, you know your one to one point five milligrams to a max of three is going to be that dose for the lidocaines. So uh, it's just something to think about for that uh, that um, antiarrhythmic treatments. Outstanding, yeah. Uh, and I appreciate you bringing that up. And again, in that context, just to remember as we've gotten our focused history, we have a much better idea of what sort of event precipitated this cardiac arrest in our patient population, specifically with like the hyperkalemia. If we, if we have that high index of suspicion, we wanna, that's one of the rare instances we wanna withhold that lidocaine and think about our, our treatment being more towards the sodium bicarb, which is weird because that's, Kind of an isolated circumstance but just to kind of throw that out there and to remember that again it's, it's in the guidelines it's good for reference and it's good to pay attention to another one we might run into or another uh, another medication that we're thinking about say your patient was in torsades any kind of VTAC sure um, you know there you go again it's 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 one of those drugs you're probably not going to be given a whole lot post ROSC but mag sulfate is going to be that treatment for those patients in that wide polymorphic you know uh, complex uh, you know torsades with a pulse per, perhaps you know um, but that's going to be two grams IV push um, IO push every 10 minutes it's one of the it, hopefully that'll smooth muscle relax and it'll calm that heart it'll calm that tissue down and it'll it'll get that heart back into a, a normal or a more, more sinus rhythm. You know, usually these, these rhythms that you're seeing though post ROSC are gonna, they're gonna be kind of ugly looking. Um, stimmies and a lot of irritability that are gonna be popping up on 12 leads. Sure, and that, and that kind of runs into that, to that other, you know, uh, what would be the fourth evaluation we're looking at, I guess you'd call it uh, in post ROSC, you know, is the STEMI, and we talked about that during the cardiac arrest. Getting that 12 lead, uh, early transmission to the hospital, early notification, get the cath lab spun up. Um, but I won't beat that one to death. But another one good as far as considering history and whatnot and in, in the mag sulfate, if you're thinking about, uh, you, you know, uh, you had spoken about uh, in the situation where it was a potential respiratory arrest and that being something good just to think about. As far as treatments you want to render, maybe in route to hospital about something that may have you, you know, so uh, yeah, the respiratory arrests are, those are the scary codes where, you know, these people, um, they probably, you, you watch them arrest or a family member watch them arrest and it's, you know, your anaphylaxis, it's your COPD, CHF exacerbations, it's your anaphylaxis. And so, uh, you know, definitely thinking if you do get a return of circulation, are you going to be given mag? Are you going to be giving epi, you know, I am epi one to 1000. Um, DEX, uh, you know, these drugs that are hopefully opening up these airways. And uh, to me, the answer is yes. Uh, I will be looking at being a little bit more aggressive on 
not jumping from algorithm guideline to guideline or trying to you know just do them all at the same time but systematically treating what what was the underlying cause and then so was this a respiratory arrest that led to this and if we're probably going to know that in those cases so we are probably have given some of those drugs even pre-ROSC and then we still may be given something titrating to effect post-ROSC and you know we always have a consortium doc available on a phone um, it's it's not doesn't hurt to be thinking this middle of the code hey doc or make that call give that doc a you know call and say hey this is what I've got um, I think this is a respiratory arrest. I'm confident we're going to get a return of circulation. What do you think about A, B, and C? Yeah, and the, the funny thing is when you end up in the trauma room later, those inevitably are the, are the medications the docs end up giving. You'll see them get put on the epi drips. You'll see them get put on the mag drips, the dex. Yeah, so mm -hmm. continuous nebs. It's just that's kind of the standard of care it looks like once you they're in that ER. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, and, and just good things to consider. Now, both of you, both of you gentlemen, had talked about the you know the irritable heart, and the, the most irritable heart I can think of again is the one that's experiencing that STEMI. They've got that blockage. They 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 have the uh, um, the the lack of oxygen to the tissue, so the heart has gone into the V-fib or the V-tac. Let's say you've gotten you've gotten this patient back. You did did an initial defibrillation. You got a ROSC. You have a sustained ROSC. Perhaps you. This patient goes into V-fib, V-tac again, and route, you, we've all had those, you know, that few and far between. But these patients, I feel like, are probably the most likely to wake up while intubated or while having uh, a supraglottic airway in place. And I wanted to make sure that we touched on post-ROSC sedation, on being able to calm these patients on the way into the ER um, in the instance that they, uh, that they wake up, that they're bucking the tube, stuff like that. So um, jumping into that, Jeff, uh, if you're able to for me here, would you uh, just comment on our, our drug that we like to give, uh, Versed dosage indications as far as the guideline goes? Okay, so as far as the guideline's concerned, so you have, you have a few options, Versed being one of those. It seems that uh, more and more Versed is probably one that we might look past in, in, in more towards like the fentanyl, it, taking an analgesic route versus the sedation route. If sedation is kind of something we're considering, maybe even ketamine if AAS is available and they have that on there. But so if we're gonna, you know, if we're gonna give that Versed, it'd be 2.5 to five milligrams. If we're gonna do the fentanyl, which seemingly more so is, is, the, is the option to choose, um, you're going to use that, you know, 0.5 to 1 mics per kilogram um, to a max dose of 3 mics per kilogram. Trying to make that patient comfortable, you know, as they're working through that event. Uh, you know, one thing to consider, too, is once you go down Versed, that's, that's you know, you're not going to want to go Versed, then fentanyl. You've given your 10 milligrams of Versed. You do have an option, though, if that patient's still being combative. Uh, you can do a no m call ketamine with AS's use. Uh, so that's going to be that 0.2 milligrams per kilogram. And, uh, you know, I would be very surprised that, that, would, that that's what you're going to have to do to sedate this patient if they're bucking that tube. Um, but that is going to be your option. Don't want to do Versed and fentanyl. That's a constant sedation. We're not going to be doing that. That's very contraindicated for us. Yeah, good, good points. And uh, every one of these is all the more reason to... Again, set yourself up for success. Never have these tubes in place without that, that uh, quantitative capnography so that you can monitor the effects of the medications, monitor if, if the patient is breathing on their own, what that looks like uh, versus what it looks like with the, the ventilated assistance. So continuing on with our pharmacology discussion here, we want to make sure that we don't miss out on our H's and T's. Once we have ROSC, we have a lot more latitude in regards to medications. Uh, that we may want to consider administering depending on, on what that history, what that focused history was that we obtained. In the setting of this hyperkalemic patient, uh, Kevin, what, what are going to be our, our dosages here the, for the sodium bicarb and the calcium chloride and how do we want to give those? Uh, so our bicarb dosage is going to be one, micro, one milli equivalent per kilogram. Usually we carry 100 and it's, that's usually about the right dose we give. We can also do calcium chloride, so that's just going to be one gram. Now, we don't want to give bicarb and calcium simultaneously. We can give it in the same line, but we're going to want to make sure we give it, I would give probably a 20 cc flush, but what I've, what it sounds like what we've been able to do is 10 cc's is, is probably sufficient. Um, there is 
potential for those two drugs to have interaction and, and cause some crystallization in the, in the line. So in addition to that, we can always do uh, albuterol at um, NEBDIN at 10 milligrams of albuterol uh, via NEB. So addressing the, the H's and T's with that is, you know, hopefully that'll, that'll get that renal failure, that uh, hyper-K patient, that heart, make it a little bit happier and get some of that irritability out. Sure, absolutely. And, you know, a lot of times controlling, you know, the various uh, electrolytes as much as we can is, is going to be the best way we can sort of mediate those like you're talking about. Going on from that, I know that we start off in the onset of a cardiac arrest, making a big point that we don't want to give D10 and we don't want to give Narcan, even when we do suspect these in the setting of cardiac arrest. What we're looking at is a patient who isn't metabolizing right now and that the like like Kevin had said the efficacy of the drug is is basically zero but Mr. Rossetti let's say we get to uh, we get in the post post ROSC situation and you still have a high index of suspicion are you going to give these what are you going to do uh, yeah I think they're definitely appropriate uh, for this particular situation you know if you're if you're ventilating a patient who you suspect is an opiate overdose you're actually doing what's needed for that patient to survive already but to help that, that process along, Narcan as as in the, you know, maybe the unconscious patient with a pulse and maybe, you know, ineffective breathing, that Narcan has a drastic effect on how that patient, on patient outcome in that situation. So I would give that Narcan um, post-ROSC. I think every little bit kind of helps in that direction. Um, if we're talking, you know, the diabetic patient, the one who uh, we get the low reading on our monitors or, you know, a... a a super low numerical value. Once we start getting, you know, circulation um, and metabolism started in this patient, giving that D10, I think, is a is a great choice to just run that congruently with your other medications or or on its own, depending on the effectiveness of of, of the things that you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. So the the biggest thing is now that now that this patient has that blood volume circulating from their actual heart beating and perfusing, now it, now these medications can start to have the effect we're hoping we're hoping for. Along with being able to correct possible acidosis through ventilation or whatever whatever else it may be, one another tool that we have on our 7-8 truck that a lot of you guys have seen in these cardiac arrests is the, the new ventilator, the Parapac ventilator. And uh, Kevin, if you wouldn't if you wouldn't mind kind of going through some of the details of the ventilator, why we may want to use it versus... Absolutely. Um, it really, it just, it frees more hands. And um, it gives us a very consist, uh, consistent ventilations um, you know exactly what you're going to dial it to, that 8, 10, 12, whatever you want that rate to be. Your tidal volume is going to be dialed in usually to your tube size. So if you have a 3, 4, 5 LMA, it's going to be 300, 400, 500 as far as your tidal volume goes. We're not really messing around with a lot of the other settings, the peep flow and the, you know, the, pressure, set, the pressure relief where it, where it actually starts alarming at. Once we get it uh, on, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really nice and just that it, it just kind of takes a lot of what normally might be some inconsistencies in bagging with whoever's doing it, but hooking it up is extremely simple. So I usually just grab another free, dedicated, hopefully very full bottle because it does tend to use a lot more oxygen out of those tanks that seems like than, than just regular BVM. Uh, you hook it to the, the high pressure port and then you just uh, hook up a circuit vent tubing and you know, as us as a seven eights, we'll have that already hooked up. So we'll literally just give the end of that tubing to whoever's near the head, tell them to disconnect the BVM part, leaving the capnography in place. They attach the plastic piece right to the end of that tube, right to the end of that capnographer, uh, capnography uh, device, and you set it, and then literally forget it. And so, and if it it does have alarm, so if there's a pressure issues, if it's it could be that, that could be indicative of needing to just start suctioning that airway or recheck that tube. You know um, what I've seen is capnography numbers usually do take a bump up. So right there alone, that's telling us that it's it's doing good. You know, one of the things that I have noticed is if it if you're on that really long that mega code, you know, you can't switch it from 100% oxygen to 50%. So kind of conserve those bottles a little bit because after 40 minutes, it will start using a lot of O's. One of the other benefits of having that vent, aside from it just frees up the hands, is that when we've used it on our few ECMO cases that we've had, it really makes it nice because there's a lot of bodies in the back of that truck. And so if you can take one person out completely and just have it hooked, hooked, up, uh, hooked up to that vent, uh, it really simplifies the process. 
Yeah, absolutely. And again, just being able to peek over to your monitor, make sure that your capnography hasn't uh, changed, you know, to any degree. That uh, that's that's your best way to make sure that everything's working out. And uh, and again, it's a, a very necessary thing with the new ECMO. Hey, so that uh, that concludes our discussion of ROSC and our overall uh, two podcasts here regarding cardiac arrest treatments after. Make sure to call any one of your seven eights or talk to your local rescue officer. Um, oftentimes those answers can be found there and uh, we're, uh, we're happy to answer those questions. Thanks again for listening.